Hey everyone, this is Teresa from Base 10 Montessori, and today we're going to go over Chapter 8 of The Absorbent Mind by Maria Montessori. And Chapter 8 is titled, The Child's Conquest of Independence. This is a fantastic chapter because we talk a lot about independence in Montessori. And the place where we often start that independence is in the practical life area. And I just put out a new video on the practical life area, the 10 fundamental concepts for the, for having a successful practical life area. So make sure to check that out. Independence is part of that. So this is a wonderful chapter. It's not too long. So if you're excited for this, go ahead and press the like button. And if you have any questions along the way, put a comment down below. And if you really thought this was great, share it with somebody and make sure to subscribe to the channel so you can see the next video that I put out. With that being said, let's start on page 75 of The Absorbent Mind, or at least it's page 75 in my book. So chapter eight starts out talking about independence. And Maria Montessori says, Except when he has regressive tendencies, the child's nature is to aim directly and energetically at functional independence. It is like an arrow released from the bow, which flies straight, swift, and sure. She also goes on to say that while he is developing, he perfects himself and overcomes every obstacle that he finds in his path. Now, in previous videos, I've said that the child follows the law of maximum effort and adults we follow the law of minimum effort so that maximum effort that law of maximum effort that's the child trying to perfect himself overcome all those obstacles so that he can perfect himself and Mar maria montessori says if we observe development with sufficient care we see that it can be defined as the gaining of successive levels of independence. And that's why in the practical life area, we might start out very, very, very small with very small, short, uh, little activities, little experiences, small works, but then we increase the amount of steps in each, each work as they go along. As soon as they master one skill, we increase the steps. We increase the amount of skills that they're doing in every single step until they have this successive level of independence. So we break everything down into these small pieces and then we start putting them together until finally they're working at this massive level of independence. Like when I do baking in my classroom for a three to six year old, I've built up to it. So when they go to bake bread for the first time, they already have all the skills of pouring and measuring, and now we're gonna put them all together. And the only thing I really do is I put the bread in the oven. But the child, well, the child has to know, first of all, how to wash his hands. They're gonna to have to know how to measure, how to pour. And also don't just think about, about it in terms of, of baking bread, but they also have to know how, how to clean up after themselves, right? They have to know how to scrub the table. They know how, They have to know how to sweep the floor. They have to know how to do the dishes. And so when my five and six-year-olds come to me and they want to bake bread, I thought, great, this is going to be an all-day activity. They are going to be so busy because I know that they don't just bake the bread. They have to do all the cleanup work too. They have to do the prep work. They have to do the cleanup work. And then when the bread is finally done, they have to cut the bread and they have to serve it to those around them. Although we did get away from that during COVID. We um, couldn't serve the bread during COVID. So we did miss out on that part, but that grace and courtesy part is really important to serving others. So that's what she means by those successive levels of independence. So on page 75, continue, we talk a little more about Horme. And if this is your first time hearing this word, I do have another video I put out about um, the five elements of the absorbent mind and other vocabulary. Horme is in there. And I also described Horme from the, the inverted meaning of it. Uh, when I talked about the opposite of Horme would be um, maybe the, the failure to thrive. So now we're gonna talk about what Maria Montessori says is maybe the, a better way to understand Horme. And she says, it is a vital force active within him. And this guides his efforts towards their goal. It is the force called Horme. 
And she says, if we tried to find something resembling this Horme in conscious life, it might be likened to willpower, but this would be an extremely poor analogy. If he is permitted to grow normally without being hindered, it shows itself in what we call the joy of life. The child is always enthusiastic, always happy. And so when, when the child isn't permitted to grow naturally, if he is being hindered, you might see that failure to thrive come in. Uh, and so think about that as, as the two different sides there to normal development versus abnormal development and what Horme means in both of those contexts. Then on page 76, she says, we might say that he is born with the psychology of world conquest. If the child feels an impulse to conquer his environment, it follows that this must have for him a certain attraction. So the child has to be attracted to his environment. And this concept is going to become even more important when we move into the next chapter. So she says, we do not assimilate first this sound and then that, or the various noises, one at a time. But we begin by absorbing all of them at once, an undivided whole. Distinctions between one thing and another come later. And so what she's talking about here is that in this, this attraction to the environment, in this world conquest that the child is on, he's taking in everything at once, but he's not discerning between them, right? He's not making distinctions between them uh, when he's first born. He's absorbing everything. And this is really still the methodology that we have in the three to six environment. So when I present a work to the child, when I present a lesson to them, and it doesn't really matter what area of the room I'm in, but this is particularly true with practical life and sensorial, I don't really use a lot of language. I don't really do much of anything, but allow the child to experience the work. And then after the child experiences that work, gets that sensorial impression of, of what's going on with this work, then afterwards, I'll extend the lesson. There's a lot of extensions in, in AMI training that you learn about. And that's where we give those distinctions and we give some more language. And then everything in the sensorial area is meant for the child to work with and gain even more distinction. So we'll start out with simply, let's say the color tablets is a good example of this in, in the sensorial area. We'll start with just the primary colors. And then color box two, we're going to get into the secondary and tertiary colors. So now we've got all the colors in front of the child. And then color box three comes the gradation of colors. So then we have all the colors and then we have their gradations of light to dark. And so we keep on working on these distinctions. And then also when we do that, then we can give language afterwards. But co first comes that experience. So Maria Montessori says, so this is the psychic picture of the normal child. First, he takes in the world as a whole, then he analyzes it. And that's where we're at with that three to six environment. For the first three years of life, the child has taken in the world as a whole. And when they come into that three to six environment, into my classroom, now I'm showing the child how to analyze it, how to see the distinctions, how to make sense of that. So that's why we say in the first zero to three years of life in the Montessori world, we say that that's the stage of creation. And then in three to six, that three to six age group, even though it's in the, in the exact same plane of development as the zero to three, because the first plane of development is zero to six years old, but that three to six year old time period, that stage, that's a very different stage than the zero to three environment. During the three to six year old stage, that is the stage of consolidation. They're bringing together all that they have created within themselves and now we have to do something with it. We have to make sense of it. We have to analyze it. We have to see those distinctions. And that's what she's talking about right here, that we have to show the child the distinctions. She goes on to give examples of independence. And if you want to read them in more uh, specificity, go ahead. Uh, but I'm just going to give a general idea of what what she's going to talk about in this chapter. And she talks a lot about um, learning to eat solid foods as a form of independence. And she talks about learning to talk helps us with independence and learning to walk. And then she says, learning to speak, therefore, and the power it brings of intelligent converse with others 
is a most impressive further step along the path of independence. And why do you think that is? Why do you think language is an impressive further step along the path of independence? And if you have a toddler at home right now that's not using language and instead may be hitting or biting or screaming or pointing, you can probably think, I understand why language requires independence because they can they can represent themselves, right? They can do things for themselves for, for understanding what they want. They have to think of something and express it. So here is this intelligent converse with others. And then she goes on to say learning to walk is especially significant, not only because it is supremely complex, but because it is done in the first year of life side by side, that is, with the formation of language. So not only do we have this, I can express something that's going on internally, and I can express it in a way that you can understand, but I can also move my body in combination with that expression. Then Maria Montessori says, no other mammal has to learn to walk. Now, I didn't Google this. I didn't double check what she was saying here. And and I thought, well, maybe the world has found a mammal that has had to learn to walk. And I didn't do that. I didn't do my homework on that. So if you see any contradictions to this, let me know in the comment section below. But uh, I have not been made aware of one that has learned to walk like a human has. And on page 78, she says, the power to stand upright and to walk on two legs requires a most elaborate nervous organization composed of several parts. One of these is the cerebellum or hindbrain, situated at the base of the brain itself. She says, exactly at the age of six months, the cerebellum begins to develop at great speed. It continues this rapid growth till the 14th or 15th month, and then its pace slows down. But it continues growing nonetheless till the child is four and a half. So that's a really interesting part about when we're talking about connecting the body with the mind during the first six years of life, this is a really important thing to keep in mind, right? The development of the cerebellum. There's lots of things going on there, both in the brain and in the nervous organization of the body that has to happen in order to to be able to balance and to be able to walk and be able to, to control motion. And she says the development of the nerves and the skeleton assist in learning to walk as well. And she says, thus, many elements of a complex piece of development have to be harmonized if walking is to be achieved. If by educational means we want to teach the child to walk before this period, we shall not be able to do so because walking depends on a series of physical developments. And this is really important to remember, right? When, and not just in the zero to six age group, any age group, that if we want a child to be able to do something, there has to be a series of developments first. And if the child is unable to do those series of developments, if they've missed out on that series, or if they're still in the process of that series, they're not able to obey, right? And this is really important when we get into the the levels, uh, the three levels of obedience uh, that Maria Montessori talks about later on. We have to talk about the ability to to obey versus, you know, the desire to obey. So we can't teach a child to do something before development has taken place. She says, in nature, once an organ is formed, it must come into use. If such experience were not obtained, the organ fails to develop normally. For at first it is incomplete. It only becomes finished by being used. It follows that the child can only develop fully by means of experience on his environment. We call such experience work. And that's why in the Montessori environment, when I ask a child to choose a work, put away their work, find a work, uh, concentrate on their work, focus on their work, any of that. We're using the word work. We're not using toys. There's a difference that the child has to develop by means of experience on his environment. That is their work. And toys don't fit into that category. Now, that's not to say that toys can't always, right? That doesn't mean there aren't 
educational toys out in the world that have some benefit, uh, but it's really very specific in the Montessori environment that we're making sure that the child becomes complete. And so it's this very, um, very focused type of experience that the child is having in the Montessori environment. Here on page 80, Maria Montessori says, so the child who has extended his independence by acquiring new powers can only develop normally if left free to exert those powers. The child develops, develops by the exercise of that independence, which he has gained. And a lot of the times I use the term auto-educate. The child is auto-educating because once we show the child how to do a certain work, once I present a work to a child and the child sees how it is done, and also the work includes a control of error that gives feedback to whether or not he's done the work correctly. And if the work has that, that um, point of interest that, that captures his attention, he's going to repeat that work. So all of that, that has to do with the freedom that the child has. And that's why in the three hour work cycle, I don't specify when a child's going to work on a particular material, how long they're going to work on a particular material. It's not like traditional school where everything is dictated for the child and everybody does the same thing at the same time. It is all completely varied. And I know some of you might have the question, but how do you keep track of anything if it's all so varied, if it's if it's all um, just so individualized. And all I can say is that um, it does take some training, it takes some observation skills, but at the same time, I also have a multi-age classroom. So the older children are looking out for the younger children. And if you're a homeschool parent, this probably sounds familiar, right? Because if you're a homeschool parent, and you have a lot of children, you're individualizing a lot of things, but at the same time, you also have a lot of support. Whereas some of the lessons you're giving, you're giving to the older children, and that naturally trickles down to the, to the younger children as well. So homeschool parents probably are able to understand this just a little bit more. If you're struggling with this idea and you're in traditional education, the multi-age group dynamic does help with this a lot. Uh, and then Maria Montessori goes on to say, so the first thing his education demands is the provision of an environment in which he can develop the powers given him by nature. This does not mean just to amuse him and let him do as he likes, but it does mean that we have to adjust our minds to doing a work of collaboration with nature, to being obedient to one of her laws, the law that decrees that development comes from environmental experience. So the child, in order to develop, in order to develop, has to have experience with the environment. And this also goes back to the idea of Horme as well, because if you're looking at the studies they did with the children who were in orphanages and had a failure to thrive, not only did that, did they miss out on having a bond with somebody, but they didn't have experience with their environment, right? That experience with the environment brings a joy of life to the child. They have to be free to experience the environment. And we don't want to give too much at the child, right? We don't want to offer too much environment for the child. And we don't want to offer too little. So that's where the education comes in of how much and what do I offer the child at what stage of development? And that is a skill. That is something you have to learn. And, and experienced parents will probably tell you stories of what it's like to go through that with their first child and what it's like to go through it with their fifth child. Uh, they can tell you all the, all the ways they've changed along the way about what they do. And then on page 81, she says, how does he achieve this independence? He does it by means of continuous activity. Continuous activity. And if uh, you listen to the video I put out on the 10 fundamentals of a successful practical life area, I talk a lot about this activity that the child has to go back and repeat activities. They have to perfect themselves through the work that they're doing and that they have to be attracted to the work and the work has to be purposeful. And that's what she's talking about here. He has to have that continuous activity. She says, how does he become free? By means of constant effort. Constant effort. The, the child needs to have constant effort. 
It doesn't mean we ask them to do things they're not developmentally ready for, but it does mean we have a series of work for them to do. And in the Montessori environment, that work happens um, in the three to six age group. We have the three hour work cycle in the morning, and then I have the hour and a half to two hours in the afternoon for my older children. That Three hour work cycle is really a protected time for the child to have that continuous, constant effort. She says, the one thing life can never do is stand still. Independence is not a static condition. It is a continuous conquest. And that's why your child has way more, way more energy than you. That's why your students have way more energy. They follow the law of maximum effort. Why? Because they must in order to have this conquest. They must in order to perfect themselves, to complete themselves. And on page 82, she says, the child's first instinct is to carry out his actions by himself without anyone helping him. And his first conscious bid for independence is made when he defends himself against those who try to do the action for him. Does this sound familiar? Are there any parents or teachers out there that think, yeah, I, I'm seeing that a lot right now. That's good. That's normal. The child has a will. They have a joy of life. And so she says, if so many people think the best kind of life would be to do nothing but sit about and be waited on, then what could be more ideal than the life which the child led led before he was born, right? The children, and I think some parents say that, and I think some people uh, do talk about this. We often say, oh man, if only if only I got to have a nap time each day. You don't know what your your what good things you've got going for you, kid, right? That's what we kind of tell them, right? Like, man, I wish I had somebody to make me a a sandwich every day. That would be nice. So, you know, I think we recognize it, but the child, that's not their interest, right? They have a conquest. They have this desire to to have this conquest of independence, this this world conquest type of an approach to, to where they are in their development. And then Maria Montessori says, but this is far from the realities of which children give us proof. They show that nature's teachings differ from the ideals which society fashions for itself. So maybe the older we get, the the further away we get from nature's teaching, right? That the child has it right. They want to put the maximum, maximum effort into things. They don't want to just sit about and be waited on. They want to do things. They want to have experience with the environment. And she's saying that's really what we need to have as adults too. That the child is showing us some truth here. We need to pay attention to it because as we get to be older, we are kind of losing our um, connection to that natural law right there. And continued on page 82, she says, the child seeks for independence by means of work an independence of body and mind. Little he cares for the knowledge of others. He wants to acquire a knowledge of his own. When we give the child freedom and independence, we are giving freedom to a worker already braced for action, who cannot live without working and being active. And she says, everything in the living world is active. Life is activity at its peak. And it is only through activity that the perfectionments of life can be sought and gained. So we have to be active. Life is activity at its peak. And that's how we perfect ourselves. And I know a lot of you out there, including me, are awfully tired. And we sure think uh, it would be nice to have a little break now and then, but She says, life is activity at its peak. We have to keep that in mind because that is how the child operates as well. Then on page 83, she says, the deviated child has no love for his environment because he feels it to contain too many difficulties. For him, it is too harsh and resistant. Today, it is the deviated child who occupies the center of the stage in the in scientific child psychology new techniques such as play therapy have uh have been worked out to cope with the growing number of disturbed children now 
I, I want to keep in mind that, you know, she obviously used a lot of different language uh, over 100 years ago, right? And it's also been translated from Italian into English. So you might find that there's some different terminology in her books that may be outdated, right? Um, but she also says here, I, and I really want to point this out because there's a lot of misconception about Montessori th because Montessori is, um, there's some misconcep misconceptions about what Montessori is and what Montessori is not. Yeah, and there are a lot of people even in the Montessori world that say, you know, Montessori is a replacement for special education. The Montessori works the same, whether a child ha is developing normally or abnormally. And this right here, this even just something as small as this goes to show that that was not Montessori's point in, in what she was creating here. She's saying, okay, here is the normally de um, developing child and they should be able to do this. And this is the curriculum that I am creating for the child that's developing normally. Now, she switches over here and says, but there are children who are not de developing normally. And because they're not developing normally, we have to create these new techniques. And so she does recognize that there are other techniques other than Montessori, techniques that are necessary for children who have some sort of abnormal development or something that's going on in their life that has uh, hindered them from developing. And she says here that play therapy uh, is a new technique and we have play therapy today. That is something that we have in our society. It's not an outdated idea. We have a lot of different therapies. We have ABA therapy works really well for children with autism. And Montessori has to work with, with those different therapies. We have to work with play therapists. We have to work with occupational therapists. We have to work with speech therapists. We cannot replace them. We don't have their knowledge. We don't have their skills. When you go to training, you learn to, to present lessons for a child who is developing normally. And then you spend the rest of your career figuring out what to do when you have a child in your room that has a... a has a, a development that's abnormal in at least one area of the classroom where you're trying to to help them progress and so she says here that the environment must offer less resistance so avoidable obstacles which the the environment contains are diminished more and more or perhaps removed entirely and that's what we also need to think about in terms of being a Montessori teacher, uh, offering less resistance when you have a child in your room that is not developing the way that you would consider to be a normal development, whatever that might mean, right? That can mean a million different things. We have to change what we're doing. We have to change it so that, that there's less resistance. So that the child can adapt. And she says, today, everything about the child is made as attractive as possible, especially for those children who feel repulsion for their environment itself. This is done in the hope of arousing feelings of sympathy and love to overcome those of diffidence and disgust. We have to change our environment right there. She's saying we cannot go on in the same normal way. We have to do something different. So if you're interested in more on that topic, I do have a video about the differences between Montessori and also special education because there is a difference we're not the same thing we're not trained in the same thing it's and it should not be a replacement for therapy and this is a uh, great point that she makes right here on page 83. and then on page 83 continued she says these are principles dictated by life and by nature which help the deviated child who has acquired regressive characteristics to pass from the tendency to laziness to the desire for work, from lethargy and inertia to activity, from a, from a state of fear, which shows itself sometimes in excessive attachment to people from the child can um, from the child cannot be separated, to a jo joyous freedom, the freedom to begin the conquest of life, from inertia to work. So if you are thinking of a child that you have experience with, either a child of your own or a student that is not active, does not have that desire for work, 
that does not have a desire for activity or has a constant state of fear where they have to be constantly attached to a particular person, then we have to do something different, right? We have to have an attractive environment and we have to have something that allows the child to have less resistance to their environment. And this could be a million different solutions. And it takes a team of people trying to figure out what that is. So there's no one answer to that. That's the hard part. But the better answer for this is that we, we bring in people that you're not alone. And if you're going about this alone, if you're doing everything alone, if, if your administration is telling you you need to do this all by yourself or that there is no help for you, um, then you at least have me on your side saying, you know what, it takes a team of people because something different needs to happen there. And Maria Montessori said so herself, right, in this chapter. So on page 84, she starts quoting uh, from Arnold, I don't know if it's Gessel, Gazelle, Giselle, anyways, however that's pronounced, he is a medical doctor, and she says, quoting him, a child has constitutional traits and tendencies, largely inborn, which determine how, what, and to some extent, even when he will learn. So we have that biological formation, right? We do have this, this built up biology inside of us that, that dictates a lot of this learning experience. And she goes on to say, in other words, he says that there are functions in the child which cannot be influenced by instruction. You can be a really great teacher, but at the same time, biology is going to have some say over how, what, and when the child learns. She goes on to quote him some more, saying the child's mind unfolds just like his body as a result of developmental processes, processes, and so when we're thinking about, yes, I know that the child cannot walk until they've gone through a series of developments, right? I know that. That makes sense. But that's also true of the child's mind. And if that's true, if you can say, yes, obviously that's true for walking, then we have to also say, yes, that's true of the mind. That the, the mind has to go through those certain processes first. And I think a lot of times we do forget that. And this is a good reminder right here. And she says, if we bring up, bring a child up in an isolated spot, far from human contacts, giving him nothing more than physical nourishment, his bodily development will be normal, but his mental development will be seriously impaired. And she, and she gives the example of Victor of Everon, which I have um, referred to many, many times. I have the movie, The Wild Child uh, by... Uh, Francois Truffaut, and I am going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to link down below in the description, and maybe even in the comment section, I will link link to my favorite trailer for that movie. I have that movie downloaded from, I think I, I downloaded it from Amazon Prime. And if you're interested in, in the story of Victor, there are a lot of books out there, but it is a true story about how he was a feral child in France and Etard brought him in to show that he could learn. He wanted to show that his techniques for teaching um, worked and Victor was one of his pupils. So if you're interested in that story, do a little bit of research there. It is a, a very powerful story. And then on page 85, she says, we cannot make a genius. We can only give to each individual the chance to fulfill his potential possibilities. I think this is really important uh, because Montessori has become a very trendy term and a lot of people have, like I said, misconceptions about what it means to be Montessori. Montessori is simply giving the child the chance to fulfill his potential possibilities. You know, and that, that is the most guarantee that we can try and give a child. And she says, the development of each organ occurs separately around points of activity, which lasts for a limited time and is extinguished when the organ has appeared. In addition to these points, there are also sensitive periods. And she says, as regards psychological maturation, this can only occur by environmental experience. 
and the latter changes its form at each level of development because the hormae changes its type, appearing in the individual as an intense interest for repeating certain actions at length for no obvious reason until, because of this repetition, a fresh function suddenly appears with explosive force. So when I talk about this, um, and, I, and this really applies to the video that I put out on practical life and those 10 fundamentals, those 10 fundamental concepts here. Um, and in that video, I talk about repetition, isolation of difficulty, concentration, point of interest, independence, control of error, adaptation, all those things I talk about in that video really apply to what she's saying right here. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check out that video next. And we have these intense interests and we have see that the child is very interested in acquiring certain skills in certain times. And that's because we are, the child has to have that experience with the environment in order to complete himself. That organ, the organs that are being developed have to have function, right? They have to have experience to be completed. And so the sudden um, explosive force that comes from the child, whether it's language development, movement, walking, talking, right? All those things, understanding the differences between his senses, all those things appear in, in, in sudden explosive force. And that those are what she's talking about right here. Those sudden appearances of intense intensity for those sensitive periods. And then on, <clears throat> and then on page 86, she says the corresponding interest of the child now passes on to some other activity that pr will prepare yet another function. So you'll see a child in the Montessori environment work intensely at one particular thing. Perhaps it's tying a bow. Perhaps for three hours of the three hour work cycle, that child keeps going back to that bow tying frame. And then they get it out and they do really well. And then they show it to another child and they show it to another child. And then they work on it by themselves some more. They might do that consistently or on and off throughout the three hour work cycle or throughout a week, or two weeks until they have perfected that. And then when they move on to that, they might start lacing. They might do something like diagonal lacing, something a little more complicated, right? So they're gonna pass on to that next skill that needs to be mastered. And she said, if the child is prevented from enjoying these experiences at the very time when nature has planned for him to do so, the special sensitivity which draws him to them will vanish with a disturbing effect on his development and consequently on his maturation. You know, when we talk about these sensitive periods, and I, I've talked about them before, but just that list of sensitive, period, it, sensitive periods is language, order, refinement of movement, and refinement of the senses. That happens in the zero to six age group. Those windows of opportunity for acquiring new skills, and those are the specialized intensity, the specialized areas which the child will be um, very intensely attracted to acquiring skills in those four areas. Once those move on, once those window of opportunities close in that zero to six age group, they vanish. So if a child wants to acquire those skills in those areas later on, it's going to be more difficult. And he's not just going to absorb them. He's going to have to go and put effort into learning them. So it does make a very big difference between when a child is able to acquire these skills. And she says, man is born with a vital force, horme, already present in the general structure of his absorbent mind, with its specializations and differentiations, which we, we have described under the heading of nebulae. And the nebulae is, it's, um, as I described in my uh, video of the five elements of the absorbent mind, uh, the nebulae are the potentialities. The potentialities that the child has that he can be fulfilled, but can only be fulfilled if he has certain experiences in his environment and doesn't exper experience any of those obstacles along the way that prevents him from learning. So she goes on to say, this structure alters during infancy under the direction of what we have called sensitive periods. So that language order, refinement of movement and refinement of the senses, those four sensitive periods that's the structure that allows the child to intensify 
his interest and acquire those skills. And she says, growth and psychic development are therefore guided by the absorbent mind, the nebulae, and the sensitive periods. So those are what guide him. And she says, the promise they hold can only be fulfilled through the experience of free activity conducted on the environment. So I don't want you to forget that, yes, she believes that biology is important, right? That does have a certain amount of determination. But when we come to educate the child, when we come to look at what his potentialities are, we need to provide an environment, an environment that, that allows for the freedom of, of developing according to, to the laws of nature. Not just give him that freedom, but also removing any obstacles that might come in his way during those experiences. And those experiences are so important that if the child isn't able to fulfill those potentialities, fulfill those skills during a certain set time, they do vanish. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. We're talking about that zero to six age group, and that really dictates a lot of what we're doing in the classroom in that three to six environment. We're making sure that we are noticing which sensitive period the child is intensifying in and making sure our lessons correspond to that sensitive period because we really want the child to make the most out of those intense attractions to those particular developments that nature has already predetermined in a lot of ways, right? The biology will, will, will really determine to an extent when that happens. And that's also why Montessori has planes of development. We have these six-year planes. And when we go into traditional school, they do everything in one year, right? Everything's divided up into a one-year learning environment. And a lot of the times with Montessori, we say, well, we're not too worried because we know in this six years, that plane, that the child really can move anywhere in um the environment in those six years. And that's why when you go on to the training for elementary, you're trained in the six-year-old all the way to the 12-year-old uh, curriculum, that you're trained in all six years at once. It's only my group that were broken down into your training for zero to three and three to six. That one is really broken down because it's very specialized. It's very intense and there's a lot, a lot of training that needs to be done just to, to handle the, the vast amount of differences and development that takes place in that zero to six environment. Six to 12, they slow down a little bit, right? We're still doing um, three, three year cycles, even, even in elementary, but the guide is trained from six years old to 12 years old. And that way we know that the child can go anywhere in that plane that they need to go and we're not worried about accomplishing it in one year, right? The child doesn't check all the boxes in one year in public school, they can fail, they can be held back. But if you're operating under a plane of development versus a one year classroom, you really have the freedom to allow the child to accomplish things based on their biology, based on the environment that, they're, that you're giving them and allow them to grow more according to the, to the laws of nature rather than a um, societal or political structure for education. So that makes just a little bit of a difference in how we go about edu educating the child in the Montessori environment. So that's what I have for you on chapter eight today. I hope you liked it. I hope, I hope you found it interesting. And if there's anything that you have a question about, leave a comment down below and I'll be sure to check it out and answer you. And if you really like what I'm doing, give my video a thumbs up if you could. Also share this with somebody who you think might enjoy listening to it. And as always, subscribe to the channel so that you can see the next video I will put out, which I think you're going to really like chapter nine. So if you like chapter eight, you're going to love chapter nine. So hang in there and I will get that video out to you soon.